Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson, number 158, we'll take a, take a look at the layered or n-tiered architecture. You can find a listing of all of the lessons I do on Software Architecture Monday at my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. When we take a look at the various architecture styles that are out there, uh, they really fall into two main categories, those that are monolithic architectures. In other words, uh, all of the code, the entire architecture is deployed as a single unit of software. And this includes things like the layered architecture, modular monolith, and even the microkernel architecture. But on the other side of the camp is distributed. And these distributed architectures are deployed through multiple units of software. And these include things like microservices, service-based architecture, service-oriented architecture, event-driven architecture, and even space-based architecture. Now, my, my, what my plan is to do in the next eight lessons is to actually go through each of these architectures. I've been meaning to do this for quite some time now and thought, well, I've got a lot of travel coming up and uh, what better time to be able to kind of just do these back to back. So uh, we're gonna start this lesson with the layered architecture. Now, what my plan is to do for each of these lessons to kind of just briefly describe the overall topology, uh, show what these architectures are really good at and when to use them, and also what they're not so good at and when to kind of avoid them. And so let's start with the layered architecture. The layered architecture is best described as a single deployment unit with functionality grouped by technical categories. Uh, those kind of concerns that are basically like presentation, for example, or business and services. And this really describes what's called a technical partitioning. Now, in the layered architecture, requests generally flow down through this architecture, starting at the top layer and going down. Layers can be opened or closed, but here is where we start running into confusion. It's right here. You see, we've got a services layer here for some shared utilities and shared services within our architecture. I shouldn't say services. I should say a shared functionality. Um, but notice what we have here is a problem where if the business layer wanted to get to the persistence layer, uh, on this diagram here, because it's closed, that would mean that we'd have to go through the services layer. And this makes no sense whatsoever. And that, everybody, is where we start getting the concept of opened and closed layers. You see, a closed layer in the architecture means that you must go through that layer to get to the next layer below it. But what we can do in this case is to open that services layer. Open layers say that I can choose to bypass that layer if I want to. And this is how we typically diagram layered architectures to show guidance to development teams who are implementing this, which layers you can bypass and which ones you can't. Uh, the layered architecture has a couple of superpowers, primarily cost and simplicity. Now, I'm going to leverage the star ratings that uh, Neil Ford and I did in our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, where one star means uh, that capability, that architectural characteristic, is not well suited versus five stars, which means it's very well suited for this architecture. And this is a fairly inexpensive architecture. It's good to use it when we have budget and time constraints because it is so cheap and so familiar. Another good use of the layered architecture is when we have and also expect most of our changes to be technical in nature. For example, we make changes to the user interface all the time. We're constantly changing our UI, but the backend components remain the same. Or maybe it's our user interface that remains consistent and we're constantly changing our business rules. Or maybe we're just constantly changing the data, but the business rules and the user interface stay the same. These are great use cases for the layered architecture because that change is isolated to a particular technical category, a particular layer, so it doesn't impact other parts of the architecture. 
Also, if you happen to have a team that is divided by technical areas, in other words, a team that only focuses on UI, a team that only focuses on business rules, a team that only focuses on shared functionality, maybe a database team, this matches this architecture fairly well. And so you can see there still are some use cases for the layered architecture. But here's times when to avoid it. Because it is a monolithic architecture style, uh, maintainability, testability, deployability, and this is what I'll consider agility here, uh, is, is not well supported. Um, if you have a smaller layered architecture, yeah, it may be fine. But in general, uh, the layered architecture is not very agile, um, especially if your teams are divided by technical area as well. And also these operational characteristics in terms of elasticity, scalability, fault tolerance, um, all of these things are not well supported either. So these are the times to really avoid this when uh, we have to get changes out as fast as possible. And it takes a long time with that layered architecture. Also, if you start to find that most of your changes are domain-based. Here's a good example. Let's say we want to add an expiration date to all of our wish list items. I, to do that, would have to apply a change across every single one of these layers. And it's not well suited if a lot of our changes are domain-based as opposed to technical-based. It's just not a very good match. Uh, and finally, also, uh, those high levels of scalability, elasticity, or even fault tolerance. This is not an architecture style that's well suited for those. And there, everyone, is the layered architecture. So I'm going to be doing this for seven other architecture styles, and this will allow you to kind of compare and contrast these and just to become more familiar with the language of architecture. So this has been the first of eight lessons, lesson 158, the layered architecture. Stay tuned in two more weeks for the next lesson, or we'll take a look at the modular monolith.